So take a look at this. I believe this is a willow cutting that I got in a creek in a nearby county and it's just this blood red. And the reason I cut it is because it had really long shoots, like long even shoots that are perfect for basketry. I was wondering if it was a native species, I mean, but at the time I definitely occurred to me that it might not be because it was so unusual. I mean, I, I pay attention to willows everywhere I go for decades. Anytime I'm in a riparian area, I'm looking at the willow to see if there's any good basket willow. And I'd never seen anything like this, but I'm propagating this out this year to uh, see how, how it'll grow when it's cultivated and how it'll weave when I, you know, actually grow enough. This has just been in a ditch um, growing, kind of struggling along for, you know, the last 10 years or so. But look at that color. Yeah, I think it's, what is it, like the 28th or 29th of February, and these chestnut crab blossoms are going to open soon. I mean, they're coming out real fast. As you can see here, we still have pomo sinel hanging on the tree. They're kind of soft and not great, but they're okay for cooking. You could easily make uh, fresh applesauce, you know, just like cook up a batch of applesauce with these. Well, there's a lot of stuff you could do with them, and they're not rotten at all. They're, they're totally solid. Even with all that scab, they're just not the best texture for eating. So I have this one branch over here is Mission, and then the rest is Padre, but you can see the bloom time isn't, you know, close enough for them to really cross-pollinate each other. So I need to Franken-tree out some almonds. I should make that a project next year. So I got my first Trichocerius panachoi planted in the ground up here on this hillside where hopefully the air drainage is good and it'll be away from the frost. I'm going to keep this almond tree right here. That one's negotiable. It's kind of unhealthy right now. But a lot of this area up here on this hillside will be um, Trichocerus panachoi, San Pedro cactus, which I'm just collecting a lot of different strains so I can start to cross-pollinate them. And just to get a genetic bank of them going. And also a prickly pear for the fruit. So I'm going to be collecting high quality fruiting varieties of prickly pear to test out. But I don't want to just plant them, so it's going to take a while. Like this, this is a hole about a couple feet in diameter and maybe a couple feet deep, backfilled with a lot of charcoal and lime and some nutrients and stuff. And here's a persimmon rootstock that I planted. Uh, the plan is uh, next summer to chip bud it, or this summer rather. I have a uh, tree in town that I have in mind as a parent that I want to graft onto here because it's um, it's probably a pretty standard variety. It's just a flat, non-astringent persimmon, but pretty big, about like that. But when I dried it before, I dried it whole, it was uh, probably the best whole dried persimmons I've ever made. So I really want that variety. It's just growing in town, like in front of a hotel. So I'll get some budwood from that uh, July or something like that and try to chip bud it on here probably. So what this mulch is about is I have a bunch of uh, oak leaves on here. So I threw some fertilizer and some oak leaves on here, but the chickens will come in here and just tear that up and they'll kick all the mulch off and dig around in here and stuff. So I had cut down a fir tree just right up here in the woods and I dragged some of the limbs down. So this will keep the chickens from getting in here because they can't scratch in this and that's going to annoy them. And then all these fir needles will over the summer just break and fall off onto the bed and then I can take the branches off later and burn them. That's the poet Narcissus. These used to be grown in England underneath orchards as a seasonal crop when the apples, you know, were not happening. So it's kind of like using the, the rows between the apple trees to grow a product that would be then, you know, sent to market and make money in the off season. That was actually like a whole, you know, thing. It was a, a system that was used in England. So I've been working on my outdoor studio here a little bit for a while. I'm trying to make a larger flat area out here uh, to use both as my outdoor studio slash work area, you know, have work stuff. And uh, yeah, so I'm just cutting this down. And also I'm thinking of it as like if I if I end up doing classes here, which I definitely like to do, I'm thinking of this as like a lecture theater kind of thing. So this is going to be, you know, benches back here so I can seat a bunch of people here and, you know, do my chalkboard like professor lecture thing on different subjects because I always do that you know I've always done that with classes is you know even a hands-on class is like you lay the groundwork first um, lecture style and then build on that so I got to get in here and keep flattening this off I'm going to build that that flat area out a little bit more and I'm also looking for a maybe a pool table a slate pool tables are made of uh, slate or an old chalk slate chalkboard or something I can put here so I can have a bigger, you know, permanent chalkboard. Now this tree is infected with uh, Phytophthora romorum, the sudden oak death syndrome fungus or whatever it is. 
but I'm going to treat this tree with this uh, phosphorus fungicide stuff that you paint onto the bark and then it like absorbs into the bark and just see if I can keep this one tree alive for another decade or so. Uh, the stuff isn't too expensive and I don't know, wish me luck because I don't want this tree to die like just because I use it, um, but I'm also kind of attached to it because I spent a lot of time here uh, working and stuff. This is an old chicken coop that is now bark storage. As you can see, uh, that's chock full of tan, like high quality tan bark. So I have lots of bark for tanning. Just got to get around to actually doing the tanning part. All back in here under the shade will be flattened off for storing, uh, you know, tubs of hides and tubs of bark and tubs of lime and tubs of all kinds of stuff and containers and whatever stuff, stuff. If anyone lives in a climate where these will grow, this variety right here is just a gold mine for farmer's market. You can make more selling flowers than you can selling vegetables. I don't do farmer's market anymore, but if I did, I would definitely be, you know, expanding these. And uh, this is called early cheer and people just go crazy. You put a bunch of these together in a big bundle and people walk by and they're like, what's that? You know, and they smell really good and everything. So you can make a lot of money on this. I need to get in here and prune these diagonal cordons. They're a little out of control because I don't prune them the way that you should prune them, which is uh, during the summer about two or three times. If you prune them in the summer twice, that's a good way to approach it. Uh, you can keep them kind of contained a little bit. But then again, we get so much sunburn here that it's good to have a little bit of extra cover and it, it works out. You can see there's tons of fruiting wood on here, so I'm not too worried about it. This is one, two, three flats of apple seeds, and I haven't counted them yet, but I'm going to do that right now. So it looks like about 257 apple seeds I planted this year, and those are all intentional cross-pollinations. That means I took, you know, the pollen from one apple and put it on the blossom of another apple to make exactly the cross I wanted. So here's pink parfait crossed with uh, one of my crosses. So this is a Wixen Rubiot cross that turned out to be a small red flushed crab. So I crossed that with the red flushed pink parfait. Becca's crab and Wixen, that's like that little one bite yellow flushed apple I was showing earlier this year, at least on Instagram. I don't know if I, how much I showed that on, on uh, YouTube. Pomo Sinel X Lady Williams, these are my two latest apples right here. Uh, Pomo Sinel Appaloosa, so this is another cross of mine. Appaloosa is a cross between Grenadine and Lady Williams. Again, super late. Lady Williams is the latest apple I have. Pomo Sinel is the second latest apple I have, except for the new Hedro apple I just found. So this is going to be a cross between basically three late hanging apples. Um, one of which has red flesh, but all of which are extremely scab susceptible. <laughs> so that's too bad. Um, Sweet 16 and Wixen, oh yeah. Uh, Williams Pride and Wixen, they're all pretty intriguing crosses. A few new things in here, a lot of F1 crosses, but I did manage to use quite a bit of my own pollen from my own crosses. So it's just getting interesting, but obviously finding homes for 250 seedlings is a problem. So hopefully some of them will die and I won't have to make that decision. And then this is mostly vegetable starts in here, leeks. So hopefully I'll get this pit filled in this year. Uh, obviously filling this in is a, quite the project here. Um, I may throw a work party to do that, but since it's gonna be backfilled with charcoal, it's not just a matter of throwing the stuff in, it has to be measured. Three different percentages of biochar and then no biochar on the end or no biochar on this end, I can't decide which yet because the soil down there changes and it's quite a bit different. So I dug this in the height of the dry season and there was still moisture down in that end. So that kind of screws up my whole plan of having like, you know, three different things or four different things to compare to each other. That's unfortunate. So I haven't decided if I'm putting the 0% charcoal in down there or the 0% here. But anyway, when this gets filled back in, it's going to be a bit of a job because all that stuff has to be measured out, you know. And there'll be other things going in here too, probably some trace minerals and stuff like that. I mean, that may not even happen this year. We'll see. I would like to get that, that put back together though. I have like six traps set in the greenhouse to get the mice before they get my seeds and seedlings. They'll go into the flats and they can smell the seeds down in the in the soil and they'll dig them up and eat them. So I'm just out here checking traps. There's a vole trap. I think I already killed one vole right here. That's probably not worth having set anymore. Uh, here's one. Looks like we caught a mouse here. I caught a mouse here yesterday that was the same size. This 
you know, small juvenile mouse. And that usually means that there's a family and I'll probably catch one or two, even three more mice that size and then the mother. But what I'm after is voles. So I don't know if you can see, but you see these tunnels. Okay, there's one there. They're like little highways. They're, they're just crisscrossing all through here. That's voles. They clear those on purpose and they make these little runways that they can zip through really fast. But what I'm really after is the vole, because look at here, This might, you might be able to see it here a little better. So he has this whole network of tunnels and it probably goes out you know, down this way. And then look at this, there's a super highway that goes straight to my apple seedlings here. And it's probably burrowing down in here under the ground eating the roots of the trees. And sometimes I'll just pick a tree and they'll just eat and eat and eat until the tree just doesn't have any roots or any bark and it just falls over or they'll come up on the surface and eat the bark up the tree. So I am gonna leave that trap set and I'm gonna move this other trap, but more than likely I'm gonna have another two mice in here in the morning. So I'm just making kind of a quick survey here of what I'm gonna be working on. So I'm starting to take some trees out. This was a cross between Pink Lady and either Rubiot or Grenadine. You know, I fruited it two years in a row and yeah, it was just time to call it out. So I accidentally cut out this tree, which I actually was still assessing just cause I, I lost track of where I was, but I'm gonna leave that to grow back. But these three come out and about, I called out about six trees, I think this year. So I'm thinking about having a work party this spring, maybe really soon within a couple of weeks even to just get a bunch of stuff done that I've never been able to pull off with this apple breeding project, get everything up to speed. I want new tags on all the trees. I want to trellis all these trees up so they're not such a mess. Um, you know, finishing this big trench back here and putting that back together, making another terrace down there, digging another bed up here for more apples, uh, more seedling apples, all kinds of stuff like that. That's one way I could approach this project and making sure I can actually get some of it done and keep doing it and ex you know keep expanding it because again it's just getting exciting when i'm starting to make crosses with crosses and getting some real results so if i could do you know one or two work parties a year but even for that you know i still need money for the project i just spent 125 dollars on rootstock for this project i need to install drip irrigation that's another project that needs to get done if i have work parties i have to feed people like it doesn't seem like that much but if you get 20 people out here and you know i don't want to be like hey come out and work and i'm not going to feed you i'm going to do an update on this whole project where i'm at where i'm headed and bat around some ideas with you guys about how to make it work so this is a tree that I grafted 21 varieties onto last year. I was also testing my tree paint, which you can see didn't really hold that well. Um, I'm still experimenting with proportions and also I use slightly different materials too, which probably accounts for some of that. It can be very durable. So what I'm looking at here is uh, doing a little bit of pruning with these and there's very little to do some of them need to be regrafted like this one died i'm hopefully getting replacements for a lot of these you know there's not a lot to do here yeah that's really fine the way it is this one i want to shorten up a bit uh, some of these have fruit buds already on them here here a lot of them actually maybe most of them have fruit buds already Here's a situation where I grafted two things into the end of one, right? So I had uh, pretty small sticks grafted into a larger stub. And there's two reasons to do that. One is that it gives you insurance in case one doesn't take, then the other one will grow and you know, it's just insurance. But the other reason is it heals up quicker. So this was actually completely healed up in one year. Like the front of this cut, which was, you know, probably, three quarters of an inch is completely healed over and that would not be the case if I only put one scion on here. So now I can just take one of these off. I'm gonna pick the, you know, leave the strongest one, take that off and then probably by the end of this year, this will be healed back up too. So this one coming out, this big one is a main scaffold. So I'm gonna go out here too and I'm gonna pick a bud, probably this bud right here, maybe one more higher. Yeah, let's go with this one. And I'm gonna put a notch right above this bud right here. And that's gonna force that bud to grow out this way and form a secondary scaffold or a, uh, a lateral fruiting branch or whatever you wanna call it. And I'm gonna tear some suckers off of this. 
These diagonal cordons, uh, some of these are getting regrafted to new stuff, and I cut some of them back and then grafted onto them, but I'm not going to do that again because I realized I can just work stuff onto these spurs, which is, you can actually fit a lot of stuff on one of these. So some of these will get regrafted this year, but in the meantime, the ones I'm going to keep, I need to uh, prune. Okay, uh, Lord Hindlip. So these, I just want to, you know, I want to keep them back into the thing. I'll usually like, there's a fruiting bud, I'll cut back to that. The best way to do this is in the summer. So this grows out and uh, when it's grown out a ways, you cut it back and then it grows out some more and you cut it back again. And that causes fruit wood to form down close to the, the stem here. Not much pruning to do on this one, but I am going to bring this back. And in spite of me pruning these very poorly, you can see there's a lot of fruiting wood on them. This is basically remedial at this point. Let's come back, cut to a fruit bud, back, cut to a fruit bud, cut back to a fruit bud. Kind of the ideal diagonal cordon form is a compact rope of fruit. So you don't want them growing, you know, too far out here. Get that back. But as you can see, again, even with the sloppy, very sloppy pruning I do on them, I'm still usually getting that effect. I get asked a lot why they're planted at a diagonal. The theory is that they'll come into fruit quicker because it simulates a fruiting branch on a tree that's growing out horizontally and is kind of, uh, you know, weighted down with fruit. And that will tend to favor fruiting, like the hormones of the tree are different. Now you see right here is one that I, I sawed off and I'll just pick one of these um, shoots, probably this one, and graft that and that'll become the new the new tree. But that was definitely a mistake um, because if you look at this one, you know, I fit one, two, three, four, five, fifteen, 15, probably 15, 16 different varieties just in this like, you know, five foot section. So here's an example of where I put two scions into one stub, but it's completely healed over now and I can take one of those out. So let's cut that back. Okay, so we're going to take this out. And then these other ones, I just want to shorten these back to keep this compact and keep the fruit wood forming. The, the trick is to keep the fruit wood forming close into the stem here. And what happens if you let these grow and then you let them grow again for another year, you end up with all this fruiting wood way out here. And then when you do your remedial pruning to bring the form back to where you want it, you have to cut all that fruit wood off. And believe me, I've done that. Uh, so you, you want to keep this stuff compact. This one I'm cutting here. Uh, this is a sucker off the old variety. We don't want that. You know, here's one that failed. We'll just take. I put two on. So one was here and one was there. So one of them survived. And I could just take off this hole. Now this one I grafted on two pieces, but it's far from healed up. There's still a lot of space in there. So I'm just going to go ahead and leave them both. Plus they both have fruiting spurs. I may just leave both of those permanently. There's not really much reason not to. Let's just shorten that, shorten that, shorten that. Lots of shortening for this type of a dormant pruning. Uh, back out here, shorten. Same here, double graft, but it's not healed, and that one's fruiting, so I might as well just leave them both. This looks like a red fleshed apple. What is this? Decchio. Apparently that's spelled with one C, though. This didn't hardly grow, but there's two fruiting spurs on it, so looks good. So here's an example. I don't want to leave this way out here, because this is, will form fruit wood way out here, and then I'll have to cut it off later. So if you're not going to do the summer pruning that you should do on this type of form, at least do a shortening in the winter. Like this one's getting pretty far out, so I'm just gonna cut that to a fruit bud, take that out, actually. Yeah, let's just leave it like that. This is also getting taller than I want it. I don't wanna have to stand on a ladder or a bucket to 
to maintain these. Once these things come into fruit, they uh, they don't grow a lot. You know, they don't grow a lot of shoots anymore. They grow fruits instead of shoots. So they aren't that hard to maintain. So I'll be going through here and picking out which ones of these I wanna graft over to put on all the new wood I've got um, already and more coming. This is probably gonna be one of them. This is early harvest. It's been thoroughly unimpressive as far as I can remember. And up here, burner rosin. So probably this whole stem can get regrafted. I could fit a lot of new stuff on here. Uh, burner rosin just has not been good at all here. If it doesn't like it here, it's just not an apple that I like or what. But I just, I haven't even eaten them. I never eat them. Looks like this died. No, it just looks dead. But that's an unhealthy apple. Oh, Padley's Pippin. Yeah, this is a weird grower. Now Canada Renette, that's a good apple. But because I let this grow out so much, I've got a lot of fruit wood pretty far out here. But I guess I'm gonna leave that because I want the fruit. That's an apple I actually like to eat. Let's just bring Padley's back in here to fruit spurs. Wittick. Wittick Pippin may be a top 10 apple here. I'm still assessing it, but it is quite good. Very rich flavors. And I think there's a couple of scions left. I actually uh, found the scions late and listed them. This is one of the Etter apples, Amboroso. It is not very good to me. To my taste, it's like, I never eat them, really. I mean, they're not bad, they're just, I don't know what it is, they're just not good. Pierce's Pasture, no. Haven't been interested in that one either. This will probably get grafted over. And then up here at the top is Orleans Raynet, which just won't grow, but it does have some flower flowering buds on it this year, so hopefully. I'll get some. So I've never tried that apple, but it's very famous and I'm very interested. This is Peace Garden. Again, I could easily graft over Peace Garden and not cry about it. It's just kind of a boring apple. There's a lot of potential here to bring new varieties in and graft them. So what I'm looking for is especially tasty dessert crabs, um, apples with very unique flavors or other unique um, characteristics, you know, more high quality russets, more super late hanging apples, stuff like that. Time to do my annual grafting bucket clean out. There's going to be a lot of garbage in here, some stuff I don't need. Probably need to go find some stuff I do need. Grafting paint. This is Doc Farwell's, uh, the stuff I use, and I'm almost out, so I have to call the local feed supply and see if they have it. The place I used to get it closed down. So I end up accumulating a lot of trash in here. This is hydrogen peroxide. Let's see if that still works. Yeah, so for disinfecting tools between cuts. Some grafting tape. I'm not a big fan of this, but I'm trying to use it up. A few nails. These are just steel nails for uh, nailing scions to tree trunks, occasionally necessary. I rarely use that, not even once a year. These are the aluminum tags I use that are cut from printing plates. Highly recommend finding a printer that uses the old school presses that use these plates and getting a stack of them. Garden tags, tree collars to protect the the trunks of trees from voles and rabbits. Stranded electrical wire, I'll strip off the, the coating and unwind it. You know, multi-stranded wire. A few clothespins for tree training. These scissors, this stuff can be cut just with scissors. Uh, that's what these are for, but I actually want these in the house, so I'm gonna put them back. Here's an old grafting knife. I actually like the Victorinox knife that I use better. Usually I'll have some guitar strings in here and I use those to kill borers. Uh, these are the grubs that get in and um, eat the tree bark. And you can find their burrows and stuff a wire up there to kill them and nothing works better than a guitar string. There might be one stashed in here somewhere but I usually keep one of those in here. 
So here's an example of the stranded wire I used. You know, this probably has like 12 or 15 or more strands in there. Uh, since it's copper, it never rusts, uh, pretty much lasts forever. I use a lot of strips of plastic for grafting, wrapping grafts, potting soil mix bags and fertilizer bags. I usually don't carry around the bag like this. Um, I'll keep that in there, but I'll cut it into strips with like a razor knife or a sharp knife on a wooden table and then just have a pile of strips ready to go. Yeah, looks pretty good. That'll be a lot lighter and a lot less messy now. I'll just clean through this stuff and throw the trash away and keep the couple of good things I want in here. This is my early Franken tree. So this is all early varieties. I'm putting on some new stuff right there. I have Centennial Crab, which I've been trying to get for a long time, and Chris Hamannix finally got it to me, and he says it's great. Like, it's one of his favorite apples, it sounds like. And uh, I've heard nothing but good things about it, so I'm excited to have that on there. Last night I bopped out here and added this right here which is a new Wixen seedling that ripens in early August. I found this last year unlabeled and figured out that it was one of the original seeds that I planted um, when I planted some Wixen seeds. I planted like maybe seven seeds and ended up uh, grafting out about four or five of them, and this is one of them. So also on this tree is this un marked branch whatever this is it's definitely a crab derivative it has these like crab characteristics it's relatively sweet it's starting to get kind of rich although it's not improving at this point it's it's definitely ripe as a coarse uh, crisp flesh it is very juicy it has some of the kind of um, crab flavor characteristics that wixen has in some ways it's not unlike bite me it, if someone said oh um, that's you know one of your seedlings that you grafted on there and you just forgot i would be like oh that explains it because it could definitely be a wixen seedling if i do remember taking off um, some seedlings no yeah so there were a couple seedlings, like there was a tree right there with that huge squash patch and melon patches, and that tree had a bunch of stuff grafted on it, and it was uh, broken and messed up by a bear. One of the branches on there that was broken, or that I tried to save, was a Wixen seedling that I had planted early on. It was one of like, I think, five Wixen seedlings that I planted originally open pollinated so it's possible that that's what this is and that would explain why it tastes like a wix and seedling and and something that i wouldn't expect to find so that's really exciting to have a wix and seedling that ripens in august i mean it's not as good as bite me i don't think but we'll see as it develops more because it wasn't doing very well in that other tree and sometimes they need to fruit for a few years before they get to their best quality but I'm pretty sure this is going to be at least in the top five of my early apples and my very early apples here. So that's pretty exciting. So what I'm sure I want to add on here now is July Red. I don't have very many scions of it. I did sell a few, but I kept some back. I told Chris Hamannix I'd send him one. So this is all of my cyan wood that I saved back for making Franken trees for people or using for myself or whatever. It's mostly the thin pieces, the end cuts, all the worst cyan wood I keep for myself because uh, it works, you know, it's good enough. And for beginning grafters, it is better to have, you know, better cyan wood that's a little thicker. Now Viking is very interesting too, and I'm going to put that on this tree as well. Very flavorful, interesting tasting apple. And as I remember, it's relatively early. Well, I better have some July Red in here. There it is. And I'm gonna graft these two skinny ones as bark grafts into the end of one, one thing. I think that'll be good. Okay, that's all I'm putting on this tree. And put all this away so it doesn't dry out. Yeah, so Chris Homanix is, hopefully we'll get to talk to him in a video sometime or something, does a lot of collecting, has access to a lot of amazing stuff, has offered, generously offered to send me, you know, whatever I can use, you know, encourage my efforts to uh, both test and distribute what's out there already and just, you know, get the stuff out there but also for you know testing stuff and for breeding and um, he's sending me a bunch more he gave me a lot of really interesting stuff last year and he's sending me some more this year so thanks much to him unfortunately i don't have a lot to send him this year but i will definitely be sending him some of my seedlings for testing a few this year anyone's wondering about my new seedlings i won't send out anything until it's named 
So if it doesn't have a name, I'm not going to send it out because I know what happens, that, like how confusing that's going to be. I want to make sure that I get to name everything because that's like the funnest part. <laughs> Um, but I do have some stuff named now um, that I don't, you know, I don't have any other reason to, to hang on to or control in any way. So I'm starting to send a little bit out. So but that will happen. Okay, let's go. Who's a handsome rooster? Click, click. Wish I had a camera. By the time I get my cell phone out, see. Okay, let's start with July Red. I'm real interested in just growing more of this apple, testing it in a different spot. You know, uh, just, yeah, I wanna see what's up with this apple. And I'm gonna replace this whole branch. So this branch is part of this whole scaffold, which was Carrie Pippin, which just has not impressed me. Occasionally I'm like, yeah, that's really good, but I don't know, overall it's just over and over again, it has failed to uh, impress me enough to keep it. So I'm not, you know, I'm grafting over another tree, which we're gonna go work on, I think, in a minute. But I'm keeping just part of this. Like, I might keep uh, this branch right here or something. But that, literally, that's enough. Like, it's pretty productive, and I don't end up using them that much. I feel like it's a better, a little bit better cooking apple than a dessert apple, and I can imagine it being really good um, as an early cooking apple. Okay, so I'm gonna bark graft in two scions here. Okay, so I could have taken this branch, and I often advocate this approach instead of what I'm doing here, and grafted on, you know, say like a scion here, and then another one over here, and then another one here, and just use this main scaffold that's already formed. But it's pretty small, and I can regrow this fast enough, and I only have two July Red scions to use here. So I'm just going to go with the bark graft, and then everything that grows from this point out will be July Red. And I'm going to graft two on here because that's going to heal the cut faster. And so I'm just slicing in and then I'm going to pry the bark up just a little bit. Hopefully this is slipping well. It should be. So on these you can make just a single sloping cut like that. But I tend to want to go in a little bit. Make a flat. Kind of come in and meet that. Makes a nice graft and then I'll put a little bit of a cut on the back here like that. Slip that under the bark. Hopefully you can see this. This little flat spot that I made kind of stops against there. It makes a real nice fit. There's different ways to do this. Like you could start with the slope like I did or just come in kind of flat and then try to turn the knife and then try to turn the knife in. And finish the cut that's probably good enough I think that'll work I just make this a little bit cleaner so I was just in a discussion on the growing fruit forum if anyone's interested in fruit trees and growing fruit um, that's an excellent forum people are real friendly and helpful there it's a great it's just a really great community and there's a lot of great knowledge there you know I was advocating for this particular knife uh, because it just works. It's it's um, it's kind of light, and that's not always good. I mean, that can be a disadvantage, but it does just work, and it's super light, and it just fits in your pocket, and it will do pretty much everything you need to do. And they're cheap, and I like the yellow handle. It's just, I almost, the other day I was making a graft, and I had to let go of the knife, and it fell into the weeds and then I finished my graft up wrapping and everything and I was just leaving and kind of like glanced down and saw that yellow handle and if not I probably would have walked off and left it there and then like maybe later I'd be like where's my other grafting knife you know because I have two and then I would just use the other one and forget about that one and pretty soon it's buried down in the the weeds and it's lost that basic thing has probably happened to me more than once because I've lost more than one grafting knife and that's probably exactly how it happened. So I really like that bright yellow handle. They do come in other colors, but you know. So I'm trying to wrap over the end here, but I'm also just going to gob some uh, grafting wax there. And I prefer to coat the scions, especially if they're skinny. It does slow drying down a lot. And the tip wood like this is less mature and it dries out quicker than cuttings that are taken from like the middle of a stick. So if you use these tips, uh, you know, that's another reason to like 
take a, a little extra precaution to make sure they don't dry out. But these will probably heal extremely fast and be getting sap from the tree within a week because it's been real warm out. I'm just looking for some stranded wire. Okay, I like this one. There's a lot of strands in there. It's about the right thickness. We're gonna cut off the end. Uh, these clippers always have a little wire cutter, they should, but I want this pretty straight. I'm gonna actually spend a little time straightening this out because it's gonna make cutting the insulation off a lot easier. I'll kind of maybe step on it and pull it like this to straighten it out a bit, get just some of the kinks out. And I'm gonna go ahead and cut this into useful lengths. I want them pretty long, like maybe a foot or more. Easier to strip in those shorter lengths. And then I'm just gonna use my beater pocket knife open L here. Yes, it's gonna cut into the copper a little bit. Um, that's not really a, a major problem. Like I wouldn't use my grafting knife for this because that's more of a high performance uh, blade with a more acute angle and I would need it to be super, super sharp. So there with just a little bit of effort I have, it looks like 19. So not too much effort for lots of high quality wire that's never gonna, you know, rust away. You know, I have piles and piles of small pieces of copper wire like this, lifetime supply. And, you know, it's a good idea to put the date on here. It's just, you know, I don't know why, it's just more information. Okay, now with these, these tags that I recommended, the printer plate tags, um, do this. So I'm wrapping it like that so that it can't, this tag can't really work against the wire because it will wear out actually. It'll, this will, this hole will get bigger and bigger if it's like blowing around in the wind on the wire and eventually it'll break off. I've actually lost a lot of tags that way over, you know, 10 years like after maybe six years or something, it can become a problem. So if your tag is gonna blow off the end like this, just uh, for the first year, just do like a single wrap and then come back around another branch like this. All right, I'm not gonna paint this scion. It doesn't need it. It's, it's a nice fat scion. It's gonna be healed again um, within a week. That's gonna be receiving sap from the tree, I would guess. So you don't want the tag to blow off. So I'm just like wrapping it for the first year. I just wrap it back around the main branch and then it can be changed later. All right, Viking, I'm looking forward to testing this out more. I've only eaten like maybe one or two ever. So what we have here is another carry Pippin tree. Again, I don't really want any of this variety or not much. So this entire tree is gonna get grafted over and I'm grafting it over to my seedlings. So this one is Wix and Rubyot 13.2. That's a small red fleshed crab that I grew from seed. All these are stuff I grew from seed. Um, you know, one is Appaloosa. This is Appaloosa. There's, I'm gonna put on black strawberry, you know, the apple I might call ice princess, anything out of the trial rows that shows any promise really, or enough that I'm just worried that I'll lose it. I wanna get a copy grafted somewhere else. The other reason I'm doing it is because they're going to grow different on this tree with lots of resources out in the sun. It's a well-formed, you know, individual tree out in the open versus these super crowded um, seedling trial rows down there. So I'm just trying to take everything that was promising, which I think was about 20 apples, I'm taking out and grafting out for further evaluation. And those numbers are pretty promising. That doesn't mean at all that I'm going to keep all of those varieties or name all of them, but they're at least promising enough that I want to get them out somewhere else. And in some cases, they're probably going to be more breeders than, than anything else. You know, further breeding of new varieties. So what I did to this branch is roughly what I'm going to do. So I, I put in a side graft in the side of that branch there. One, two, three, four. And that pretty much fills this branch out pretty well. So on a branch like this one right here, I'm gonna come in, probably cut this, put one here, one here, one here, one here, and probably something down here off the side, maybe onto here, or maybe just into the graph. So that'll be one, two, three, four, five different varieties. 
I cut a lot of these long with uh, fruiting spurs on them because I'm hoping that I can graft these, keep these fruiting spurs and get these into fruit production right away. So this, for instance, is the one I ended up, uh, for, well, I'm probably going to name Ice Princess. You guys had a lot of clever names. And uh, I, Princess Pine is another one that I'm thinking about. And that's, there's kind of a backstory on that with uh, this tree that uh, my landmate wrote a, an essay about. But it's probably going to be Ice Princess or Princess Pine. But until I name it, I'm not sending it out. So don't ask. So this is a good size for grafting. This is one year's growth. That's the previous year's growth. In all likelihood, I can graft this on. It'll heal. It already has one, two, three fruit buds on it. I'm looking at the width of the wood strip here and that wood strip there. And it looks like I might've gone slightly deep. So I'll probably set this off just barely to one side. But chances are that will be a success. It's hard to do this and talk. Okay, now I want to check this and make sure it's, see, I can wiggle this and it, it wiggles a little bit up here, but all this is solid back here, so we're good to go. Another thing I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to larger tags like this because I can fit a bunch of information on here. As long as I have a pencil, I can make all kinds of notes on both sides of this tag, right? That's pretty useful, especially with my seedlings. If I'm just sure I have a pencil when I'm in the orchard, I could jot down notes on flavor and all kinds of stuff that, uh, you, just, you know, attach directly to the, the branch. Golden russet 11, 12 is the number designation. I'm just going to write ice princess. How exciting is this? Major progress here in the uh, apple breeding scenario. I'm probably going to be using pollen from this variety or, gra you know, or you know, pollinating it with uh, other late hanging apples. I'm pretty sure this is at least going to hang into January. Okay, one down. Time to make some more tags. Now I need to take my own advice and go get more of these. I don't even know, it may already be too late, but there's there's probably still printers that use these old presses, but most of them are probably trying to convert to, uh, you know, large inkjet printers and whatever the new technology is, or, or laser, I don't know. Also because I need more of them that don't have writing, you know, like this only has a little writing. Now these here I actually had cut already to make tree collars, so I kind of hate to cut them up because that was a lot of work. I uh, see it has these little tabs here and it has slots here. So I put it together like that and slide it, slide it together and make this tube and slip this into the ground, maybe like an inch or two. And that'll keep uh, almost all the voles out from chewing on the bark of the trees. I think I'm gonna keep that. These are a pain to cut when they're wet. So I'm gonna set them out to dry in the wet sun there is. So if you're just doing a few tags, you know, scissors are fine, but if you have a paper cutter, much faster. Think about like this. Okay, I got a pile of those tags made. Production efficiency. Do a bunch of those at once instead of one at a time. Okay, here's an interesting Ru Rubyot King David. This had one apple on it, but it seemed real promising. Oh, what's this here? What is this I spy? Look how red that is. Is this a King David cross? Yep, Rubyot King David. Let's taste it now. Okay, this is Rubyot King David 14.5. So this looks a lot like King David, even though it's totally messed up with scab there. Whoa! Firm, crunchy, tart, not ripe. Very interested to see what this turns into later. This one's getting grafted out somewhere. Even though it's totally not good right now, I just... I want that. I want to get that out of here right now and get it growing somewhere else. Here, uh, very, very red flesh and dark red skin like King David. It looks like, you know, these have some potential fruiting wood here. It's kind of hard to tell if those are real mature fruit buds, but they look like it. I think I'm going to graft this one, but I might graft the second one just to make sure. The thing is, if they fail, if the grafts fail, I can like regraft them next year. So. Yeah, I might be able to do a bark graft. You know what, I think I might do both. I mean, why not? 
I'm the one doing the grafting. I make the rules. Move my hand. I have my hand right here. That's like a little dicey. Probably not going to slip. I'm pretty good with those cuts, but that little voice in my head, the little safety officer was like, eh, watch it. I tend to listen to that. So I'm going to take a real thin cutting off the end of this here, and I'm going to put a little bark graft in right there. And that's going to look like just a long sloping cut here with a little thing on the back. My guess is both of these grafts are going to take. Pry that up. As Henry Rollins says, slip it in. I don't like Henry Rollins. Okay, wrap it up. When I first got that rooster, I thought he didn't seem that loud. It turned out he was just really young. Within a couple months. <laughs> he was like that. This is too wiggly. Uh, I don't like this grafting tape. It doesn't allow for a tight enough wrap. And it just doesn't, like when you wrap it, it doesn't, the wraps don't seem to compound enough. I think maybe I just need to take it slower. But it's clearly inferior to what I usually use. So I am gonna paint the end of this really well with the grafting paint and the whole scion probably. I won't paint any of this until I'm finished. I'll bump into it, get paint all over myself. It's just more efficient to do it all at the end. Now anything I don't want, like, um, you know, old wood on the, I'm just gonna take out, but this is gonna get cut back here for the next variety. And you can see here, I'll go ahead and cut everything back to what I'm gonna do. So there's one. Um, you know, this will get grafted in this section probably just because this is nice and clean and easy to graft to versus this like long old uh, fruiting spur type of wood. This is growing too much into the tree to use that. This is too close to that. If I use this, it's going to get chopped off. This part of this branch is ready to go and the only thing I may add is I might put in a side graft right down here. If I do, it'll probably be one of these that I just want a second scion of. But this one and this one will be different varieties than that one as well. So we have one, two, three more to fit on there. That'll be five total. And I may add something here and something there that's a replica of one of those five. It just got cold and windy and we got some weather blowing in here. So I'm gonna have to go at least get some different clothes on. <laughs> But uh, no more of this project for today. I think I'll just finish this another time. People say my enthusiasm for stuff is infectious. I hope so. I tend to think of my presentation as uh, kind of dry, but I'm obviously passionate about most of the stuff I do. And I just have to say this is, as we say in NorCal, hella exciting to be grafting out these seedlings and knowing they're gonna fruit. Like some of these could fruit this year on these graphs and yes i will probably let a few fruits hang there um this year possibly we'll see really exciting all this progress and having so many uh you know 20 out of i think 55 i'm thinking roughly of apples for my breeding project that i'm you know wanting to to further assess so that's a pretty high potential success rate, I guess you would call it. So I'm gonna get out of the weather here. One of the things I was gonna do today, I was hoping is uh, paint this trunk with the fungicide to keep this tree alive. And I should have done it like a couple of weeks ago. I mean, it hasn't rained for maybe three weeks or something like that. You know, I don't wanna put it on and have it wash off. It's this stuff that, you know, soaks into the bark. So it's kind of like DMSO, it's a carrier. So there's, you know, DMSO, if you put drugs into it or anything into it and rub it on your skin, it, it'll take it right into your bloodstream. So it's the equivalent of that for trees. It probably is DMSO, I don't really know. Obviously I don't wanna apply it and then have it wash off in the rain. So I'm gonna to need to, predict the next long dry spell and just hope for the best and put it on. But I do want to get it on because as soon as it warms up, you start to get the, the infection. And I can see this is the worst I've seen on this tree. And it doesn't look like much to most of you probably, but right here and right here, there's a focal infection. 
and it's bigger than it looks probably and there's probably a lot of them that just aren't showing yet so i do want to get that going because as soon as it warms up the the organism starts to grow much much faster and this is the worst time of year when you'll start to see some of this uh, bleeding coming out of the cracks in the trunk i don't think this rain's going to amount to much it's just like a little local spring weather thing Basically, this is like at an angle, and I'm just trying to straighten this out and make it a consistent width, which is a four feet of bed. Disturb this poor lizard here. It's, he's super cold. He's moving really slow. Just tuck him in under here. Oh, we lost a piece of that. It's pretty far gone, but I'm still usable. Get these iron pipes out of here. Another very useful item, old steel pipe. Use tons of it for this. Other things. So if I measure one of my other beds, I'm pretty sure it's going to be five and a half. Yep, five and a half. So 18 inches of path and four feet of bed. So I'm beveling the top of this stake off because if I don't, when I hit it with uh, my hatchet and or a hammer, it's gonna splinter. And there goes my nice redwood stake. I mean, that may not look like much, but listen to this. That's probably 80 years old, at least. It was an old fence post, and it's still like super solid. Also a great tone wood for instruments, you hear that? Super resonant, woody sounding. Makes good guitar tops. Well, I have to say I'm surprised, but this is almost level, and it looks like I can get away with using this crappy piece of wood for another maybe five years if I'm lucky. Some more soil in here. I can get that. I have already have some dug out. But one thing about this bed is I don't like it. It dries out fast, it's not productive. I'm guessing there's maybe some rock under here or something. It might be worth investing right now and putting some biochar in here to make this a better bed. Now ideally, especially since it's not a good bed, it would probably be better to dig it out to two feet, see what's under there. If there's a bunch of rock, throw it out, replace it with soil, bury char all the way down to two feet. Yeah, so I need to decide about that. I'm gonna I'm gonna think for a few minutes. It's time to murder this. This is harding grass. Super annoying weedy plant here. One of our worst weeds, most destructive. I'm guessing it probably draws down the water table, but hard to say, I'm not really sure. So the reason this bed was angled is because of this path, but I've been slowly taking out the artichokes on this side and replacing them with a row out there so I'd have more room to expand this uh, this bed and possibly put in a second one there or a small angled one there, but I think I'm going to leave that open because it's nice to have little open area, staging areas to park a wheelbarrow and have some, you know, tools and buckets and whatever you need, rather than having the entire garden reduced to like 18 inch wide paths and, you know, no other place to put anything except on the beds. So this, you know, this artichoke's gonna come out and then eventually that one. This one is super productive. It's this real spiny one that I remember counting and putting in a video how many it produced in one year and it was over 70, I think. But that's the same variety and that's planted on a big pit with uh, biochar and stuff. So that's gonna be the replacement, but I might let this grow for, make heads for one more year before I take it out. This grass right here is kind of weedy. I don't really want it in here. Unfortunately, it's already, dropped a ton of seed but i'm going to do what i can to get it out of here and i'll throw it down in this ditch over here where it could actually if it grows down there it could actually do some good to help you know it's a nice look at all that seed <laughs> it's nice uh, bunchy grass it has a, you know kind of hold the soil in place now those seeds will wash all down into this wash and probably some of them will grow Okay, so here's the situation. I have these three, uh, one, two, and three beds I wanna put biochar in. That already has 25% biochar up to one third of the bed. And I'm not sure what I'm gonna do with that one yet, but one of these at least I wanna make into what I call a biochar graph bed. If you put different percentages of biochar 
but don't do anything else different. You grow the same things, fertilize it the same way. You basically get an analog graph. You know, it's only going to show you actual like growth and plant color. Um, maybe some productivity. It's not like a complete measure of biochar's effectiveness overall because there's, you know, there's multiple factors involved besides just how big the plants grow. But it's a pretty telling uh, thing to have this thing and be able to stand back here and look at it and say, you know, look, this is the difference between, say, 0%, biochar 5% and 10%, or 5, 10, and 15, or whatever. Very useful information. I would love to see a bunch of people do this, and I'm probably going to, you know, put together basically like a biochar graph bed challenge uh, and consider that... <laughs> you know, the challenge challenge to you to do that because um, it's not just going to give you a bunch of information. Like, you know, if you do 0, 5, 10, and it's like, duh, the 10 is way better. Now you have a, a benchmark, right? And you're going to put 10% wherever you can in your garden. And then you can make another one that's say like 10, 12, and 15, or 10, 15, and 20. And maybe there's, you know, the results taper off and then you've got something to go on. But I don't think I want to do that with this bed because it's not a very good bed. And again, I don't know what's wrong with it, but there's just something off about this bed. So I think I'm going to go ahead and add biochar because I think it's really going to help the bed do better. But I'm only going to dig it in about a fork's depth, which is, you know, a digging fork depth. Like the teeth are about 10 inches long usually. Realistically, it's, you know, a lot of times you kind of like call it a foot, but it's not really a foot. It's more like 10 inches. So for that, I can just kind of prepare the soil, add soil to this section, loosen the soil, like dig it all up with a digging fork and a hoe and just really loosen it up and then put the biochar on top in a, a certain thickness, right? If I want 10%, um, which I do, it's going to be a little over an inch, right, for uh, a 10 inch fork step. Like if I did an inch, that would be close enough to 10% to call it a day, but I'll probably just add a little bit more. So I can just, you know, use a ruler or a measuring stick and just, you know, level it up or put a board there or something and level the biochar up to an inch or inch and a quarter thick and then come along and just dig it in really well. Um, so I think that's what I'm going to do with this and just uh, apply approximately 10% across the entire bed. And I really think that's going to improve the bed and I can get that done now. I could probably finish it today. Now, since this used to be a pathway, it's going to be super compacted and I definitely want to get in here with a fork and loosen that up to a full fork step. I to be careful with this fork because the uh, handle is cracked. I actually made this this handle. It, it was really nice. It's just that I made it out of an old ash handle for another tool and it just was a little bit too thin to hold up over time. Um, but these actually are not that hard to make. I might do a video sometime. You just need a little steam and a little piece of uh, you know wood cut to exactly this shape right here. Leave these long so you can bend it, bend it into shape with the handle in here. You know, drill that, put in a bolt or a rivet, rivet this. Just get this nice and wet and super steamed through so it's very hot, and then you can cut around that off. Pretty easy. And I could fix this with a strap of metal, like remove this and put some kind of like formed piece of steel here to reinforce this. Uh, maybe I'll do that sometime, but I'd almost rather just make a little bit thicker handle, maybe out of a little bit tougher wood. Not that ash isn't good, it's just like hickory's probably better for this. What's nice about the ash is it's light. And ash is more kind of like traditionally used in uh, England for these type of tools. But as I like to say, it's uh, time for us to all stop drinking the hickory Kool-Aid because there are lots of other handle woods. Some guy tried to tear me a new one on my oak axe handle stave splitting video, saying that, you know, I was an idiot because oak wasn't any good for handles, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, actually do a little research on that. Egomania is a global health crisis. I want the whole bed dug and loosened up so there's no like huge clots left. Probably come in with a hoe and chop it up. Another thing I'll do is uh, this motion right here. So I'm only taking about a two inch section and then I'll bust it up this way, like pry it a little that way and then come up, tip to the side and then grind it. 
and that pretty much everything falls apart. So it won't work on every soil every time. I just happen to have pretty friable loam. And then, you know, a few stabs for good measure. And if you want them to take the weeds off, that's a good way to get started. I'm gonna leave the weeds and just chop them in and see how that works. And they also have been pulling nutrients out of the soil, right, for since the fall rains. This represents a lot of fertility as well. That looks like more like 16 inches. Nope, that's 17. Now I'm warm. I'm gonna do this first and just try to really break this up pretty good to a fork step. Again, that's probably 10 inches. It's 11 inches. I'm probably just gonna call it 12, an inch and a quarter of charcoal approximately. That's gonna get me around 10%. Oh, the one other thing I'll do is I'll just add fertilizer in with the biochar uh, so I don't get a nutrient drain this year. Like, and I'll add extra, you know, I'll add maybe even as much as three times more. During the first season here, I'm gonna be adding a lot of extra fertility, any kind of liquid fertilizer like urine or, or um, manure tea, like soaking manure in water and then watering it on. And that should offset any, um, you know, heavy nutrient drain because the charcoal is going to suck up a lot of nutrients right at first until it sort of reaches an equilibrium. So you don't have to fertilize extra. It'll work itself out over time. But if you want good crops the first year, you do need to do something about that. And I don't pre-charge my biochar because um, it's just a big hassle, even for this quantity for me. You know, I've proven adequately to myself just adding extra nutrients the first year will get me as good or better crops than I usually get. And what, what more do I want, you know? It'll work itself out from there. It's just a more elegant, easier solution. However, one other thing I'll probably do is, before I chop that biochar in, is throw down some uh, duff from the forest. It's kind of like a sourdough starter, and not all of it's gonna survive. I mean, it's stuff that's used to growing almost on the soil surface in the woods, so it's not like 100% of what's gonna to wanna to grow 12 inches deep in a garden bed in the open. Hey, it can't hurt and it's pretty easy to do. Everything you put in there is not gonna live. Like, the profile of organisms you dump in is going to change. Some of it's gonna die, some of it's gonna grow. That seems like a given. So this is one of the biochar tree pits I did. I think it was the last one. Yeah, it was the last one I did. So this is pretty fresh and there's all kinds of gross rotting stuff underneath there. And I kind of broadcast all kinds of different stuff like herbs and greens. There's um, lettuce, mustard, mizuna mustard, cilantro, and I'm not sure what else on here. This is gonna be able to take advantage of all those nutrients. Those greens are gonna grow like crazy. I'm pretty sure this bed is producing heat from all that rotting stuff down there because I had a stick poked way down there and when I pulled it out, it seemed like it was a little bit warmer than uh, the top of the bed. So that may also really boost the growth of these things. Now I did put this over here to put some plastic on here, but I couldn't find the piece of plastic that I wanted to use. I also planted um, garlic all around here. This is just like garlic that was wild, uh, plant, you know, growing in a big clump and I just dug it up, pulled it apart and planted around the edge here. I probably won't put a tree on here until it sinks down and settles in. Uh, maybe like next spring, I'll, I'll put a tree back here. In the meantime, I'll be growing that tree that I want to put here in another garden bed and getting it ready to go so it's already an established whip uh, with a tall leader that i can train how i want it so you can see here i planted another you know dug another tree pit here it's being backfilled with like garbage and weeds and stuff and soil and charcoal and this mound of dirt is on top of an, the one i did before that which i would like to plant a tree on this one this year and also grow other crops on it like maybe some melons or corn so i'm going to start clearing this off and use a little bit of the topsoil i took out of that pit to fill in this bed that we're working on this is nice uh, topsoil here real clean so anyway, what I'm saying is I have a pit over there that's about seven feet in diameter. I'm gonna add a bunch of charcoal so I can afford to use up some of this dirt elsewhere is what I'm saying. I'm also gonna end up putting a board 
right across here. I'm not in a hurry to do that. Maybe I'll do it today. I really need to get on my garden preparation. I barely have this much energy, so I'm going to use it right now for this because getting this partway done doesn't do me much good. It'd be really nice to just have it done and possibly planted uh, by, you know, early this week. Okay, let's talk about physical efficiency for a minute. Watch what I'm doing here. Okay, now I have a, first thing is I have a system, right? I've come up with a system that works. I know I need to go about two inches back, push in, and then I have a series of movements. Um, the first thing I'm gonna do is pry up, then I'm gonna go over here, and then kind of make kind of a almost like a figure eight and that's gonna like thoroughly bust up the soil okay another thing I'm doing is my motions are fluid so by the time I'm finishing with this I pull it up and put it back here and so I'm not stopping right so that was too big of a bite so I flubbed my system there so I'm gonna stab in like this grind and then I'm already back and I'm not doing a lot of extra motions. I'm not, you know, moving my body a lot more than I need to. And once I get into kind of a flow, this actually goes very fast. And again, the system may not, my, I should pause that. Immortal Battles in the North, by the way not for the faint of heart. And then the other part of my system, I'm gonna push this back over because some of it spills over, so I have a line to go to next time. And then just a little bit of stabbing to get any clots that I missed. Again, not a lot of motion. Stab, twist, up, stab, and like, as soon as I'm finishing this twist, I'm already pulling it out. Boom. So, let me start another. I have to do this part this way. Economy of motion is huge. Too often neglected right back up and I'm just stepping with this uh, front foot just as much as I need to, to get my push there. So let me just stop talking and I'll show you what this looks like. Just kind of as little motion as I can get away with while, you know, using good body mechanics. I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to move too much. I don't want to move too little and have to use like extra, you know, maybe not take advantage of my body weight as much as I could. Efficiency matters. You expend X amount of calories about how much you're going to get done. And how much time are you gonna to buy to do something else? Maybe some other goal that you have, maybe spending time with your family, taking time to cook real food. Grub ho, everyone needs one. Let's go get some charcoal. This charcoal I had run over by a, I guess you'd call it a miniature track hoe or a mini excavator it had rubber tracks. About 10 minutes or less, it just wiped this out. Anyway, I tried my truck, but the tires were just too narrow. Fortunately, that species of oak doesn't get sudden oak death. So this board is going to keep me not only from crushing the soil in a bad way, like, you know, with heavy footprints that are really going to compact the structure of the soil. We want this. We want this crumbly texture we don't want to just smash it into a powder but it's also going to pack the bed flat as I go and then it'll pretty much be ready to just apply an even layer of uh, amendments and this is a quite a bit of work obviously but I'm doing a lot of things at once here I'm chopping this grass up deeper into the soil making this well pulverized so I can mix the 
amendments in evenly. Yeah, that's a little thin there. About right there. I think on average this is going to be pretty good. No, that's thin. But that's thick. That's about right. Again, about right. I think on the average that's pretty good. Is chicken manure tea? Very old, actually. It's gonna have a lot of, it still has a lot of nitrogen in it and trace minerals and phosphorus. Probably a lot of nitrogen, although it's so old, it's hard to say. And I'm not gonna dilute this today because I'm not applying it directly to plants. You know, again, the nitrogen is gonna get sucked up by that charcoal. And of course, this will have a lot of bacteria in it. Can we make it to the end? Perfect. I think that's good. Let's go get some forest off, and then I think we can dig this in. We'll throw this extra fertilizer out here on the bite me tree. I cut this back real hard this year, so it's gonna have a lot of scion wood next year to send out. Here, I'm just gonna take off all the big undecayed leaves. And you can't do this every year. I mean, this is part of the forest ecology here is this. But again, for me, it's it's not really nutrients or fertilizer, it's just a source of microbes, and that's probably enough for the whole bed. But I'm gonna grab a little extra while we're here. Okay. Okay, time to mix it in. Try to really go deep by picking this up and sifting it. I'm gonna do that several times. It's gonna take a while, but that'll get it nice and deep. So it looks like I'm gonna do it four times. So I'm not gonna finish this today because it's gonna take a while and I'm beat. Once I do this, I'll be ready to plant, but when I plant, I'll probably actually put on more liquid fertilizer like probably, you know, just pee in a bucket and put that on right away. Or more chicken manure tea. Okay, I'm done. Over and out. Uh, mm -hmm. 